Thanks so much for that wonderful introduction. It's really an honor, and thanks uh, Hassan and Fariba for putting on this wonderful event. Um, I've really come to develop over these last years quite an intimate relationship with the Iranian-American community, and um, I've had, Fest and John was not the only good thing I got out of it. <laughs> I got a lot of good things out of it. Um, so uh, I thought that this evening, uh, rather than uh, talk to you more about Iran policy, which we're all uh, wringing our hands about. Let me finish with that, but I want to talk a little about my own uh, engagement with Iran, uh, how I became uh, interested in this particular project, and how it is that, that this book, All the Shah's Men, came to exist. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's a story about journalism, but it's also a story about history and about the coincidences that shape life, as uh, many uh, Hafez poetry lines will tell you about. Uh, so uh, years ago, I don't want to think it was that many because I'm still in my own mind uh, a lot. No, my my uh, calendar is lying to me. My, uh, my passport has a very odd date on it. But uh, it was some years ago. I was posted in Istanbul as the New York Times bureau chief. Uh, like all New York Times bureau chiefs, I was assigned a geographical area to cover. So since we don't have a correspondent in every country, each correspondent has to cover a group of countries. So I got to Turkey, and I was assigned to cover Turkey, plus the new nations of Central Asia and the Caucasus. So I had Armenia, Azerbaijan, Georgia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, and Turkey. Uh, so that was, all of those countries had only come into existence like a couple of years before. So I immersed myself in trying to learn everything I could about Georgia and Kyrgyzstan. That was part of my job. However, uh, one thing journalists have to be able to do is be ready to respond to unexpected situations. Uh, actually, I suppose most adults are supposed to be able to do that, but not so many are. Um, one day I got a phone call saying, uh, we got a problem with our coverage of Iran. Uh, there's an election coming up, but the person who we normally send can't go. I forget now whether she was, uh, couldn't get a visa or she was sick or something like that happened. So you got to go to Iran. This was the election of Khatami. Uh, so suddenly, I was thrown into this uh, unexpected situation of having to go to a country that I'd never really studied about and didn't know much about. And I've never been a Middle East scholar. I, I'm not, I've never been involved in the Arab-Palestinian issue. I'm not really an Arabist at all. So the Middle East is not my specialty. Um, but anyway, I've covered plenty of stories that are not my specialty, so Iran, sure. This is really the extent of my knowledge. I mean, I got a phone call one day saying, you got to go to India. I had to do that too. So Iran was just another unexpected country that I had to go to. And as Frida pointed out, I've had a lot of experience having to do that suddenly. So I arrived in Iran suddenly, within 24 hours after the first time I was ever told to go there, and not really having much time to prepare. I didn't know very much about the Middle East, but I did know one thing from the vague reading that I had done over the years, and that is that most countries in the Middle East are fake countries. They're just made up by some British diplomats drawing lines on maps on some men's club in Pall Mall after World War I. That's why there's no such thing as Iraqi heritage or Jordanian tradition. These are all modern inventions. So that's the one thing I knew about the Middle East when I got to Iran. Well, it didn't take me very long inside Iran to realize this is no fake country. This is the opposite of a fake country. I, I've rarely, if ever, been in a country with, with not only such a long and rich history, but in which the citizens have such a sense of their history. They don't, well, we treat Iranians like they're Paraguay or Burundi, but they don't think of themselves that way. And this was very clear. You can't be in Iran more than a few hours without grasping the fact that this country has existed in more or less the same boundaries with more or less the same language for thousands of years, something Americans can hardly grasp. So I was uh, sucking in all of this. And uh, this was at a time right before the election, in, uh, of the Khatami election, when uh, they had opened up the country almost completely for journalists. 
I got in a car with my photographer and we just drove all over Iran. We didn't know where we were going or what we were doing, but we had a fantastic time. It was two weeks of just driving around this amazing country. And uh, really, you people have all grown up understanding what is Iran. But for someone that just comes in without understanding it, it's overwhelming, it's stunning. I don't think there's any country in the world where there's such a gap between how many great things there are to see and, and how few people there are that go there to see them. And I'm so glad to be able to go there that now, because if this were a normal country, those Japanese tour buses would be lined up outside Isfahan. You wouldn't be able to get in for days. You'd have to make reservations weeks in advance. Now I go there, there's only a couple of tourists walking around the big square in Isfahan. So I'm, I'm glad I was able to get there during this period, despite all the other problems. Uh, now, I've had the chance to cover many countries, as Trita mentioned. One of the questions that I always ask myself when I get, get to a country, especially a country that I don't know very well, is how did this country get to be this way? So why is this country rich and powerful? Or why is this country poor and miserable? Um, I asked this question uh, while I was making my first visit to Iran. It was before I had gotten home, and as soon as I got home, I decided I got to read 10 books about Iran. But while I was there, I was just taking it all in. And one thing became immediately clear to me. There's a huge gap. There's a huge disconnect between what Iran should be and what Iran is. When you look at Iran's history and, and the accomplishments of its people, not just in history, but at this moment, you wonder, how can this country be so isolated, so backward, so out of the world, when it has had this tremendous history, huge cultural achievements, a hundred years of work towards democracy, and diaspora communities that are hugely successful wherever they land in the world. What happened? Why is there such a huge disconnect between what this country should be and what it is? Well, as I started talking to people and asking them this question, and then as I got back and started reading about Iranian history, I kept coming back to the 1953 episode. So there was a time, and it wasn't that long ago, when Iran seemed to be on a good path. And after the period after World War II, they were developing towards democracy. Finally, what they'd been working on for 50 years since the Constitutional Revolution was coming to fruition. And then, Something happened and everything went wrong and the next thing you know we had 25 years of something bad and then you had 30 years of something even worse. So what happened? Immediately I realized, I got to get a book and find out what happened in Iran, 28 more died. What happened? Imagine my surprise to discover that there was no such book. Nobody had ever written a book on this episode. And when I would consult, this is even truer to this day, when you consult a history of the 20th century, some huge fat encyclopedia, you'll be lucky if you can find one line about this episode. Uh, it's remarkable how it's been passed over. And I think that's exactly what the United States hoped would happen. It, it did succeed. But I decided, if I'm ever going to get to read this book, I have to write it first. Nobody else is going to write it. So I set out on the path of trying to figure out what happened, try to untangle this story and try to tell it in an engaging way. So that my books are all about reaching audiences. I, I'm not just interested in writing for specialists. Uh, during this period when I was writing this book, uh, I developed quite a close relationship with Mossadegh. I began to learn all about him. When I first started the project, I'd only begun when I realized that Mossadegh had been on the cover of Time magazine, as many of you know. Uh, he was the man of the year. So uh, I decided that I wanted to get a copy of that Time magazine. And I don't know who else, it's hard, they're hard to find. I don't know if it's because all patriotic Iranians have bought them up or because people that hate Mossadegh have bought them all up and burned them. And there was no eBay in those days. Uh, but I, sure enough, I found that uh, Mossadegh Time magazine cover. And I'd also brought back from my, one of my trips to Iran uh, an envelope with the stamp of Mossadegh. You remember there was like about a one year period when the window opened for Mossadegh. But that was like the year 1979. From that year, from the beginning of that year to the end, you could talk about Mossadegh and he was a hero. After that, it closed again. 
<laughs> so that was it. We had one year out of the last 50 years when it was possible to speak openly about Mossadegh in Iran. At that time, a stamp was issued. I got that stamped envelope and that Time magazine cover, and I had them framed. And I put them up on my wall. They're still there now in my little office where I do my writing. So what it means is that as I was writing this book, I, I literally had Mossadegh looking down over my shoulder every hour of every day. It was an inspiration. Uh, I felt like he was saying, tell my story. Bring me back to life. Because this truly was a figure who in the outside world had been completely forgotten. A man who had been man of the year, chosen over Eisenhower, Truman, Douglas MacArthur, and Churchill. But suddenly he's been wiped away from our history, which is exactly what the Americans had hoped would happen. 